Hey guys, how's it hanging? Now, we still have a good bit of time before the Magic Leap does come out. And not only that, we still have a good number of mysteries surrounding the product. So I thought this would be a great time to do some research. Try and figure out exactly what it is, what it's going to do, and how it's going to do it. And I definitely ran into some brick walls along the way, but I found some good information too. So I thought the best thing to do would be to put that all together and put it out. And that's what this is. This video is a closer look at the Magic Leap and the concepts explored. In it, we try to break down some of the science and the components behind what's going to make this thing tick. Obviously, because there's so much to it and it's so complex, I'm hoping to put this video out in separate parts. It's just too much to cover all at once, but it should be interesting. And before we start this first one, I have to give a big shout out to YouTuber Adore TV. He gave me a lot of great information and insight on how to put a video together. So if you guys ever want to see a great video on anything to do with the computer hardware market, anything to do with GPUs, CPUs, APUs, AMD, Intel or Nvidia, go and check his channel out. I'll put a link in the description below. It's great videos by a great guy. Shout out to Adored. Okay, so let's get on with this one. Now, if you know anything about the Magic Leap, then chances are you've already heard of the scanning fiber and the laser projection system. So perhaps you're thinking that's where we're going to start here, but <laughs> we're not going to. I think of all the Magic Leap components, that's the one that's been discussed and explained really well. You can pick up some great information on it from pretty much all of the big technology news outlets. If I get enough requests, then I guess I'll go back and cover that too. But for now, let's go on to something more interesting. In this episode, I want to start by talking about the Photonic Light Field Display Chip. So the name alone is enough to scare most people off. How about we get a direct quote on what it is from the company themselves? Here's one from Magic Leap CEO Ronnie Abovitz. He describes it as, quote, A three-dimensional wave component that has very small structures in it, and they manage the flow of photons that ultimately create a digital light field signal, end quote. Well, what the heck is that? Well, basically, it's one of these. This is really neat. All right, so if you can hear that, that's a, this is crystal. It's a crystal block. But if you can see in here, let me zoom in real close. Guys, you know what this is? A computer laser etched these, a herd of elephants inside. It's, it's a 3D laser etched image of a herd of elephants. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pause this here because you probably know what this is. It's one of those souvenirs that you buy on holiday or maybe in your local shopping center. But what we're actually looking at here is one of the most simple forms of a photonic display that you can find. Now, this thing isn't going to be projecting any light fields, but what it's doing is using the very small structures embedded within it to change and redirect where light goes. That's basically it. That's pretty much Photonics 101. Anyway, let's watch one of these get made and see if it can teach us anything more about the Magic Leap lenses. Let's go. So you start with one of these here. Now, the important thing to notice about this block is that in its unengineered state, it's allowing light to travel freely through it in all directions. So what we see is a clear, transparent block. But because of the material that the crystal is made out of, because it's photosensitive to certain types of light, when it's exposed to a laser like this of a particular intensity and focus, that part of the crystal that is struck by the light is changed at the microscopic level. Instead of allowing light to pass freely, it there instead scatters the light. And that makes all the difference in the world. So as the laser is being guided by a CAD file on the computer, we can see here that layer by layer, a recognizable structure is being etched, embedded into the crystal. And here it is, our brand new photonic element or photonic display. We now have a device with an engineered structure embedded within it that will manipulate the flow of light that travels through it. In this case, forming what we recognize as an image. So how can we compare what we've seen here to the Magic Leap so far? Well, let's borrow a page from one of their patents. Now you can see here the overall structure, 146, the rectangle, well that would be the same as the lens that we've already seen. 
And these curved lines within it, ranging from 148 to 158, well, those would be embedded structures. They're guaranteed to redirect any light that passes through that zone in the same way. In this case, steering it towards the eye. And that's really a lot of what photonics is all about. Okay, so now that we all understand the basic principles of photonics, let's jump forward to see how impressive this technique can really get. It's much, much easier to transport. It's just a thin piece of plastic that can go uh, in a carry-on luggage or uh, easily in an envelope. And then it's displayed with a simple point light source. So there's just a halogen bulb, bulb above me that's displaying it. We also sell it with an integrated, uh, 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 an integrated display stand where the light source is already included. This particular format gives you the ability to get all the way down to street level and all the way above to get, get above uh, you know, kind of a, a bird's eye perspective view. Full color, glasses free 3D and with an amazing amount of parallax. See how you can see above and below the roof structure? Yeah, that. And all on a thin plastic film. How are they able to do this? Well, it turns out kind of similar to the last technique. So just like the last one, you need a laser etcher, like this, a CAD file on a computer to guide the lasers, like this, a photosensitive material to etch your structures into, like this, and at the heart of the process, a team of lasers carving light manipulating structures into the material of the display. Now if you notice here, they're actually using red, green and blue lasers so that they can etch in structures that have a specific response to different wavelengths of light so that you perceive a full colour image. So here it is, a sophisticated photonic display. Still only static images, but let's compare this to the crystals that we saw in the last example. Now, their ability to interfere with light was pretty basic. They created images by treating all introduced light the same way and relied upon a binary mechanism to either scatter or not scatter a given ray of light, depending on which part of the display it was travelling through. In this new example, we can see zebra imaging using the techniques of holography, of creating holograms, to precision etch in minute structures called holographic pixels or hoggles, that each represent many small viewpoints of a given scene or object. Now, although these are using the principles of holography and the interference of different light rays, this display is all still hinging on the principles of physically embedded structures. We can tell this because, look here, in this example they've actually etched two scenes into one display. It looks like a moving image, but as the camera's line of sight passes over the 90 degree angle, we're seeing light return from different faces of the same structure. If you've ever seen a close-up of a microlens display, it's kind of a similar characteristic. As the image shifts, we're seeing light return from two different faces of the same structure. It's like seeing two different sides of the same mountain. Okay, so enough of the bad explanations. Who are zebra imaging and why are we looking at their displays in particular? Well, there are a few reasons here. Firstly, they're right at the cutting edge of what's being done with using light to etch highly sophisticated photonic structures into display mediums. But there's more than this. At least one of the creators of this technique has been brought in to work at the Photonics R&D lab at Magic Leap. Not only that, the company themselves, Zebra Imaging, is actually based in Austin, Texas, in the same building as the Magic Leap Photonic R&D lab. So there's a clear relationship between the technology that these guys developed and what Magic Leap hopes to use in their final display. Before we move on, the last thing that caught my eye with this company and their displays was the light source. There is no backlight or a use of a built-in illumination system. It's all relying on a simple spotlight somewhere around the display. Light travels down into the structures that they've created and reflects to create an impressive image across a very wide viewing angle. So my first guess when I saw this was that Zebra Imaging's role in the Magic Leap process would be to oversee the creation of the display lenses using their ability to etch light manipulating structures into photosensitive material to create the embedded structures that we know Magic Leap says their display needs. Especially if you consider that they could combine these structures with the high precision strictly controlled light source 
of the Magic Leap scanning fiber and the laser projection. So that was my first guess. Zebra imaging making the lenses and combining that with the Magic Leap novel light source to create a powerful display. But I'm not so sure now. Take a look at this picture. This is a photograph of a Magic Leap development kit taken from inside the optics department of their R&D lab. And there are some things going on here that are relevant to what I'm starting to understand about the Zebra imaging technique. Mostly to do with the separation of the color channels, the amount of fiber optics going into each side. I don't know. I need to do some more reading, but we'll come back to it in another video. <laughs> this is exactly what makes Magic Leap fun and annoying at the same time. Everything that you think you found, it's like another rabbit to chase down another rabbit hole. It all leads from one mystery into another. But I promise we will come back to it in another video. Anyway, the discussion of who's going to create the Magic Leap display elements lets us move on to the last couple of things that I want to look at in this video. Okay, so to talk about what makes this thing a chip, or to talk about any kind of sophisticated photonic element, we have to talk about waveguides. Anyone following the augmented reality scene earlier in 2016 may remember that there was a lot of buzz going on around another headset called the Meta 2. So before this one was revealed, there was a lot of speculation about whether or not it was going to be a rival to the Magic Leap. And just like the Magic Leap project, one of the biggest questions around it was, how was it able to create its display? Now that we've seen more of it, the tech behind it isn't as revolutionary as some people were expecting. Take a closer look. You can see that rather than creating a novel display system, they've actually instead repurposed a traditional smartphone display and positioned it at a 90 degree angle to a Perspex projection screen. So with an LCD or OLED type display positioned so as not to block the wearer's field of view, the images it produces bounce off of the surface of the screen into the user's eye. Because the image is reflecting off of a screen, the display output has to be inverted and they're probably doing some pinning or barreling to the output feed to counteract the distortion effects of the screen geometry. But they don't have any precision control over the optical properties or characteristics of the photons driving the image. Things like depth of field or ambient light control, they're not able to do. So there's a basic representation here. On the left hand side, we see a simple image projection setup where the lights coming from the display reflects off of the surface of the projection screen. Over on the right hand side, it's a similar setup of components, but the difference here is that the light from the display is instead being injected into the medium of the screen. Even though it's a similar lens-like material to the reflection screen on the other side, here it's acting as a waveguide, as light travels through the material of the element and follows the laws of internal reflection and refraction, you can use particular pathways and structures embedded in the element to give or change some of the optical characteristics of the light that does eventually emerge. And this is one of the biggest things that the Magic Leap pattern images show an interest in. The DK50 AR glasses from Loomis are a working example of this more sophisticated technique in action. So one of the first benefits that you're going to notice here is the smaller form factor. They've been able to greatly minimize the display and internally house it within the arm of the glasses. Using a system of projection and mirrors, the image is magnified as it travels through the medium through the waveguide of the lens. If I zoom in here, you can see that they have embedded structures, possibly etched, into the lens. And these are directing the light out of the waveguide and into the user's field of view, into their eye. It's a much more sophisticated approach and very much closer to what I expect we'll see from the Magic Leap themselves. But take a note of the overall technique anyway, because we're going to need to talk about it a lot more in videos to come. So back to the Magic Leap. They're talking about multiple action performing structures, multiple distinct pathways through the medium, and a switching mechanism operating on the order of kilohertz. That's all controlling input, pathway, and output of the total apparatus. Sounds like a chip to me. The only real difference is that instead of using a traditional conductor-based circuit that carries electrons, electric charge, here we're seeing a glass or crystal-based chip to carry photons. Yeah, it's pretty weird. 
So this is about where I start to see that designing and creating a display or chip isn't a job suited to a company like Zebra Imaging. The principles here have more in common to what we normally see in the planning and design of a traditional processor architecture. I think this is the main problem with Magic Leap. I think this is what makes it so difficult to understand. For so many years now, our common thinking and our common understanding of electrical devices, of technical devices, has been electricity. What you do to electricity, instead of manipulating the flow of photons, we're used to manipulating the flow of electrons. The embedded circuit, the microchip, transistors, resistors, light emitting diodes. It's all about taking a dumb stream of electrons from out of the socket in your wall and funneling them through very carefully designed, very carefully laid out architecture structures. It's a lot like the same way that you move traffic through a city. If you've ever taken a close look at a motherboard, it kind of looks like one of those. You can see different routes and different lanes and we're used to the idea of having clock speeds and resistance and heat build up and we know that if you try and send too much charge through one part of your board, it's a lot like creating a traffic jam, gridlock. And most people that you talk to, they understand it. You could walk down the street and have a conversation with somebody about gigabyte storage, flash storage, the number of embedded pixels in your OLED display. We are used to having a common knowledge on the manipulation and the exploitation of electrons. We know that game. But Magic Leap AR and VR technology, they're completely changing that. Instead of being all about the, the way that you change and move electrons, now it's becoming all about the way that you change and move photons. And never mind modern society, the modern tech world has so little experience with dealing with photons hands-on. Most of the time when you're having a conversation about photons, you're some kind of physicist. It's, um, it's a question for pure science. But now we're seeing that migrate into commercial applications and it's jarring to pick up. I don't know anything about the speed of light or the movement of light through certain optical properties or windows or constructions and it is really difficult to grasp but i think this is something that we're going to have to get used to going forwards all things considered there's a lot going on here and a lot more to look at in episode two all right guys that about wraps it up for this one if there's anything that i missed or something you wanted to ask drop a comment below or head over to the dedicated sub on reddit i'll leave a link in the description other than that i'm out